everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along. So Natalie is, uh, from my point of view, a de facto member of the Centre of Excellence. She, uh, she works with me, and I've enjoyed that. And uh, she also co-supervises some of our PhD students. You would have seen that in her brief bio. And uh, we've got a bunch of projects uh, still going, which is uh, really good for my point of view. Um, I have no idea what this title means. I've read the abstract. I still don't know what it means, but we're about to find out. So. Oh, <laughs> okay, thanks, Paul. Yeah. The, the title was there to just try to get someone to show up. That's like, yeah. <laughs> now, now, for those of you who aren't um, old enough to remember, Douglas Adams was actually the author of that really famous series, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, and the whole series starts when you've got this Englishman lying in front of a bulldozer trying to stop his house from getting knocked down to make way for a highway. And this alien arrives, as they do, and, and he said, oh, listen, mate, you've got much bigger problems. Um, we think you need to get off the planet because Earth is about to be destroyed to make way for an intergalactic highway. <laughs> so, 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 so believe it or not, there's, there's a connection here. And, and to me, the connection is that issue of scale. Arthur Dent was thinking at a small bulldozer scale and, and really many of the issues that are tackling a lot of the environmental economists and, and some of the policy issues that confront us play out at a much bigger scale as it goes through that. And you'll have to wait to find out what Albert's got to say about it later on. That's my way of trying to keep you interested till the next bit. Um, the other one, of course, because even though I'm doing the presenting on this one, um, the ideas have been stolen from lots of different people, and um, I've tried to acknowledge them as they go through, but uh, the, the, the mistakes are my bits and the good ideas are theirs. Um, all right, so, so when it comes up to talking about the, this whole issue of environmental economics and scale, I guess I often think about the issues that are confronting economists when they deal with the things of trying to tackle these issues of temporal scale, trying to tackle these issues of, of social or population scale. Um, I've, I've put geographic and product scale together on one axis because I couldn't actually draw four dimensions. Um, but that was sort of conceptually, it's that type of thing of how many different products and goods and services are you talking about, how many different people are you included and what time scale are you, are you talking about for all of those. Now, basically, most of the, the economic valuation techniques that have been developed have been developed at a very small micro scale. So they start by wandering around and asking an individual how much they value an environmental good or service or product and um, at one point in time. They then actually use those, so, so they're all based on the microeconomic theory of the consumer or the microeconomic theory of the firm, and so it's an individual firm's costs or an individual consumer's values, and then they try to scale them upwards to come at what they call their market values or the market thing. And quite often what they do is they just add up the cost of all the individual businesses, or they add up the values of all the individuals as they go through, and in this way they derive a market value for an environmental good or service or something else. They then actually try to embed those within policy and, and they help to make it relevant. And in, in fact, the US legislation helped to make the, the evaluation thing very relevant by embedding cost-benefit analysis in, in within legislation in many places saying you must undertake these and you must consider environmental values in the assessment. So often what they do is they'll take this environmental value or the market value and they'll compare it against their developmental value and, and this will be the way they'll try to assess whether the benefits from the development are going to outweigh the, the cost of the environment or the degradation as it goes through. And that's sort of the way that the environmental economics literature has developed from, from that area. But there's also been some, some parallel literature that's actually more heavily, heavily embedded within the macroeconomic branch. So, so macroeconomists tend to work at much larger scales. They'll work with very aggregated data, so they'll play with GDP, which describes all production of an entire economy, or they'll let you describe those sorts of things at country level investigations. And some of the earlier types of investigations they were looking at, for example, were those where they were investigating the environmental Kuznets curve and they were saying, is there a relationship between CO2 emissions and GDP growth or all those types of things. But in those, they sort of glue all these individuals together and treat them as if we're all the same or, or, or they, they say, oh, they're just a representative consumer when, when they start to battle and draw them. But they're not giving much detail about what's happening within people and the interactions. So there's also a body of literature that starts to, to look at these general equilibrium models. And those ones, instead of talking about GDP as a whole, 
they'll divide up into lots of different sectors. So they'll say, well, we'll look at the production of the agricultural sector and the mining sector and, and households and government. And then we'll look at the way they buy and sell goods and services and wages and labours and exchange that and build that into a model that's got the interaction between the two. When that gets into the environmental type economics arena, what they're normally working with those is that they'll add to the model the water use of a particular industry or the CO2 emissions of a particular industry. But they're not actually putting or not frequently putting the dollar values on there. It's the quantity estimates that they're working with when they're adding environmental considerations to these things. So there's actually quite a move within many policymakers and, and, and the, the growing popularity of environmental valuation has led to all these websites where you can get on and get all the estimates of value of, me, of reefs in and around Mexico or the Indian Ocean and all this type of thing. And there's this push to turn around and say, maybe we can add these values into some of these bigger macro scale models our policy models and, and make them more relevant. And of course, I think there's there's a few challenges in being able to do that that, that come from uh, a need to understand some of the nitty gritty behind what these micro scale valuation models are really doing to help overcome some of the problems that are arising when people are throwing them into these big macro scale assessments. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to the, this whole economist perceptions of economic value to be able to start to, to go through the journey on, on how that then develops into valuation methods. And, and despite the reputation for being, you know, just you want to bulldoze everything and knock it up and how things are only as important as they have dollar, I say what distinguishes <coughs> the economists from the accountants is that the economists are the ones that go beyond the dollar. And so it's been in the literature for a very long time in economics that there's a recognition that the environment is worth a lot more than just trying to, to, to extract resources from it. So the value of the reef is much more than our ability to earn money from the fisheries or our ability to earn money from the tourism and, and things like that. That there's all sorts of other values, the aesthetic values that are associated with it, uh, that we can do those. And so there's all the different ways that we use them in, in sort of passive or, or fairly consumptive extracted sentences that people benefit from. There's also ways in which people benefit from the environment in an indirect way. So for those who are, I love watching the seagulls. I've never grown up. I still like actually watching them fight over a chip on the beach. So you know, even if I never go to the reef, the fact that the reef is part of an ecosystem that helps sustain bird life, marine life and things like that, that I can turn around and enjoy it so I get some indirect benefits from it. And to the extent that you might say the North Queensland coast gets less beach erosion than the Gold Coast, some of that might be because of the, the way of attenuation of the reef, etc. So there might be some financial benefits that we accrue from the protection that the reef affords us. So those ones that we often talk about it as being indirect uses. And then for those of you who sort of grew up with parents like mine, they always turn around and say, keep your options open. And, and so even if you're not using the reef and, and you're not doing it properly, it might be a good idea not to trash it just in case sometime later you might want to use it. And, and so there's these things called option values. And then, of course, they talk about all these things called existence and bequest values. And those would be the warm, gushy feelings that you have. You might be a person who believes that the environment has intrinsic value. It doesn't have to have humans using it to make it worthwhile. And that in itself is a benefit. And you might want to be able to hang on to the environment to pass it on. <coughs> so, so the economists get a really bad press. But in fact, they were hanging around for a long time. This is back in the 1950s, 60s, when they were saying there's all these other values that need consideration. Um, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment sort of helped bring it to the forefront a little bit more, but they're telling a similar sort of story, that there's lots of different ways in which people benefit from the environment. And so in some sense, these the guys have got more in common than against each other. But what distinguishes and, and, and sort of characterises the, the total economic value framework of doing that is that a lot of this has been developed in line with, with ideas about how you would come up with a monetary estimate of the value of those things. So whereas the MEA categorises the different values according to whether they're provisioning or regulating or, or supporting services, these categorisations are actually linked towards ways in which it is or is not possible to go away and, and develop techniques to put monetary <coughs> values on those. So there's a bucket load of different techniques for assessing the, the value of the environment. 
And, and I've grouped these into sort of the, those types of techniques that go out and, and get numbers directly from the marketplace and throw them together. Those that actually try to, to get information from people's behaviour and draw inferences about that. From those who actually go around asking questions to get people to state their behaviour. And for those, the benefit transfer where, they, where they're moving estimates that have been made in one area and transferring it to another. There's probably a library within each one of those subcategories because uh, I think economists suffer from what I often call micromania. It, it's a need to add more and more detail to each thing that they're doing and so there's a zillion different variations of each one of these techniques as they go through. The simplification, though, is the fact that, that, that a lot of these market valuation techniques are ones much along the lines of the access economic stuff that says we've got $5.3 billion worth of expenditures that are associated with the tourism and the fishing industry throughout the reef, and so they're grabbing the prices or the costs and the multiplying it by the quantities to get this expenditure data. You've then got ones that would turn around and, and estimate the cost of how much does it cost to repair beach erosion or how much does it cost to, to replant seagrass beds or those type of things. And that might be another way of trying to come up with an estimate of value as it goes through. Then we have those revealed preference techniques. And the reason they've had to develop those types of techniques is because there's a lot of values out there that you can't just turn around and look at a price and grab it. And aesthetic values is, is a classic one where you can say, how much is a view worth? Well, they have their, these hedonic type pricing techniques where what they'll do is they'll try to grab a three bedroom house in, in Annandale and they'll match it to an identical three bedroom house in North Ward that's got sea views. And then they'll try to look at the difference between the price and use that to draw inferences about what the sea views are worth. So those are the sort of the, the hedonic valuation type things and the tricks they do there. The wage differential thing, similar types of ideas. So look at how much someone gets paid who, who lives and works in a really revolting environment and they'll compare it with how much someone gets paid who lives in paradise and the differential has given you an idea about how much you have to compensate someone for a bad environment. So, so they pull up on, on those types of techniques when they go. Now, the important thing in this context is the fact that these types of techniques where you just grab a price off the shelf or you look at behaviours and associations between wages and house prices, etc., environmental things, is that there has to be a market attached to that something, either directly or indirectly associated with. So the housing market and views, the labour market and wage differentials, those types of associations. So they're only really picking up the, the use values, the one on the left-hand side of those. If you want to pick up the warm, fuzzy feeling values, the existence and the bequest values, you've got to then start working with these stated of preference techniques. Now, in theory, when you play with those stated techniques, you can actually estimate the value of anything. It, it, it depends upon how clever you are when you design your questionnaires or your experiments, and, and they have all different sorts of techniques for doing that. But because all these different techniques are actually using different types of data, they actually generate different types of data. So even though they've all got dollar signs next to them, they're not. That first type, the access economics expenditure type of thing, is basically estimating things like rectangles, price times quantity. The hedonic type approaches are basically estimating straight line, marginal values. It's just the extra value of the view or the price. It's not then multiplied out through all those other types of ones. The travel cost approach is estimating these things called consumer surpluses, which are, which are like triangles. And in fact, depending upon how the contingent valuation survey is structured, they're estimating something different altogether. And then there's variations in each one of these studies of how you set it up exactly. So when you get these big databases where people are turning around and saying, oh, OK, now we actually know what the um, recreation value is worth, and we can compare that to the um, fisheries value, and we'll say that the fisheries value is worth more, they're committing a very grave error because they may be comparing rectangles and triangles. And you can't be sure that the recreation values are worth more than the expenditure, the beach erosion values, because you're actually working with inherently different types of uh, types of data in that. So the first lesson to come up with all of these is if you're trying to go from sort of transform from a technique where you're working with uh, 
dollar estimates that have come from a micro technique that's been designed to value a particular type of good and service, you can't just turn around and compare that one with another one. You have to make sure that the valuation, the things you're comparing, have all been <coughs> estimated from the same type of valuation approach so that the differences you observe are actually really attributable to the service, not to the methodological approach that you've been chosen to do. The other one you have to be really careful of is the fact that, that the value of the whole may not be equal to, to the sum of the individual parts. And I call this my Venn diagram problem. And here I'll put it in triangles instead of circles. But it's that same issue, that you, you've got to be sure that the aesthetic values are different from the recreation values, are different from the tourist values. And in fact, there may be a lot of overlapping and blending between the two <coughs> as that happens. Moreover, we've got all these problems because some of these estimates that come out of these valuation techniques are quite sensitive to, to changes in income and assumptions about the income distributions. They're going to be very sensitive to, to people's expectations when you're asking questions and you're valuing things, people's perceptions about what the future is going to give them versus how reality actually pans out at the end of it all. And also these changes and in interactions with, with other types of markets and systems and, and the feedback through there. So I just thought I'd go through with, and talk a little bit about some of those as they're happening. But before that, I'll, just sort of, I'll, I'll pin down the, the other really quirky thing about economist valuation, because this is important in understanding the, the heavy-duty theory that, that underpins all of this. And as, as Helene Marsh pointed out to me, I never quite realised how much, the economists are obsessed by method, and, and everything is, is driven by theory. So you really sort of need to work out what's happening with the theory to understand it. Now, in essence, the economists don't believe you can actually measure how happy someone is and compare the happiness against that with someone else. So that, the, the psychologists might think they can do it, but of course the economists know that it can't be done. So I'll come back to this issue later on because that's an important bit. So what they do is they actually turn around and in essence say, well, what we do is we don't have to know how happy someone is to be able to work out how valuable things are. What we, the only thing we have to be able to do is to identify bundles of goods which a person is indifferent between. And so here I can say, well, I know that there's more to, to life than just money. So I've identified the fact that there's two things that make people happy in life, money and people. And, and that would be the type of thing. And then I could turn around and, and, and I could say to them, let me identify two baskets of money and people where if you were given a choice between them, you'd shrug your shoulder and say, I don't care, I don't care which one it is. And so in this case, I've actually come up with the idea that you might be offered $100 and, and dinner with Tom Cruise or you might be offered $1,000 and dinner by yourself. And, and if you got to the point where you'd say, I'm indifferent between the two, then the economist will say, Tom Cruise is worth $900. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in terms of his ability to generate utility for you. Yep. So it's, it, it's that contribution to utility. Um, and that's when they talk about the value of the environment or, the, or these other non-market values. That's the, what's the monetary equivalent in terms of how happy they can make you be. Okay. So... We start with these valuation estimates, and I can pay. I've gone round and I've conducted this study, and I found out that um, Tom Cruise or something else I don't know might be worth 100 bucks to Sue, 100 bucks to John, and, and 200, uh, 2,500 to David. And so that, that's the total value when I want to scale up from the individual up to the population level. At this point in time, it actually doesn't come across as being a problem at all. You, you, you know, what's the issue? But it might be the case that I then want to compare this value with other values. I might be using it in cost-benefit analysis to say how much is this worth compared to development. I might be using it in conservation planning to say I want to try to prioritise one area against the other. So I need to actually do the same exercise, a group on another set of values. And so here I've gone through when I've asked them all how much they value area B. And of course in this one, what I end up with is concluding that area A is worth more than area B. Or the development is worth more than area B. But it's actually start looking at the nitty gritty of that and this issue of the aggregation and the scale starts to come up because you recognise that two of those three people have said that they actually have a very strong preference for area B. In fact, they're valuing it at three times as much. But because that other person is in there and they're such a big player and they've got so much money, those values are the ones that are winning out. 
And so what we find is, in fact, once you start recognising that these valuation things are tied to income and someone's willingness to pay is actually going to be tied to their ability to pay, we soon recognise that these valuation techniques are blending the income and the preference techniques as it goes through. Now, how much does it matter in the real world? Well, we started playing with, with some stuff. We've got an article under review where we were playing with some data that we've collected in Northern Australia and also some data which Christina Hicks had collected. Not, you know, she's not here, though, so I'm not actually whacking her data up here. But it was doing a standard contingent evaluation study where we were wandering around and asking people, saying, there's a development proposal that's going to come up but it means you can't get to the rivers anymore. So this is across Northern Australia where we were talking about whether people could use the rivers for swimming or picnicking or fishing. And we said if this development proposal came through, it might have closed off your area of the rivers or your local water holes, you can't actually use them anymore. How much would you be willing to pay to stop that development? So, came up and it said, well, the poor people were willing to pay about 40 bucks per household, the middle income people about 131, and the higher income people about 185. We rejigged that. And the interesting thing on those ones, though, is that if you look at it as a proportion of the income, the poorer people were actually willing to contribute a much higher percentage of their income towards the protection of their rivers than the richer people. And we thought, well, this is really interesting. So what we did was we just played a bit of a, a, a silly mind game, and we said, well, we'll go away and estimate an aggregate value of these rivers doing the normal way. And so we'll turn around and we'll grab the $40 per poor household times the number of house, poor households, and then we'll grab the $130 times the middle-income people times the number of middle-income households, and we'll grab the 185 times the number of rich households. We'll add it together, and that will give us the total value of the rivers. That was the standard one. Then we thought, well, what we want to do is we want to compare and we'll say, well, what would happen if we say that this reflects the preferences of the poor being willing to contribute 0.4 of their percentage income to that? So we said if we gave all of the regional income to the poor people and they then put 0.4 of it back to protect the environment, that's going to be one of our estimates of value. And then we played the next mind game and we said, let's pretend we give all our money to the rich people and they're only willing to give back 0.13. What's their estimate of value? And surprise, surprise, it's been quite a bit different. So if we were using the valuation and we're reflecting the preferences of poor people, we're coming up at about 15 million. If we're using the preferences of the rich people, we're coming up at close to 6 million. So whether you approve a development proposal or not is going to make a big difference in terms of what that, you know, the, the power of income. And this was a simplistic example. It turns out to be a much more complex interrelationship between income and the substitutability of goods, etc., etc., which makes the math and the diagrams more complex, but it actually just even exacerbates the problem and makes that income effect even larger. So we know that these value estimates are, are quite sensitive to methodological approach. We also know they're quite sensitive to, to assumptions about income distribution. And we can throw in and say, well, what, what about the difference between expectations and reality? Well, it was back in the back in the 30s when uh, we had people pointing out the fact that there's this real difference between ex ante and ex post constructs in economics. So your ex ante are when you're going around and you're talking to people and you're saying how much, you know, what do you expect to happen? What's your values? And they're, and they're building their, their estimates of whether you buy car insurance or whether you you take an umbrella with you to work a day. They're built on your expectations of what the day is going to be. And then of course reality sets in. And, and if you do an assessment ex ante using people's expectations versus ex post, you may well come up with quite different constructs. So this has been around for a while, and there's a little bit of this in the environmental economics literature, but not perhaps as much as you might like. Well, then Marina started playing with this, so she's one of her PhD students, and she started mucking around, and, and she was bailing up fishermen while they were putting the boats into the water down at the, the Townsville boat ramps, so all hours of the, the night and day for a year, about a year. And then she was actually phoning them up afterwards to, to bail them up again and say, well, how did the day go? So it was a really nice, well-constructed study. And uh, she was asking about how much they expected to catch, why they were going, etc., etc. And then afterwards, she was collecting more of the socio-demographic information, the stuff that's going to be fairly constant across time. She found that expectations about recreational catch were largely driven by the sort of motivators. 
And, and so it's the sort of things that the people who thought they were going to catch a lot were the people who thought fishing was a lot of fun and who thought it was really good to eat lots of fish. The reality in terms of who caught what was then actually driven more by the personal variables, such as how long they'd been fishing, how much experience they had, by external variables, such as the phase of the moon, and then obviously we know that it could be driven by the availability of fish out there, which means it's interactively um, there according to what the actions of all these other individuals are. So first up, we, we know straight away there's a difference in the drivers and, and the determinants of these systems, whether you're looking ex post or ex ante. And of course, these were reflected in the values. So she was using the hedonic pricing technique to estimate the value of catching an extra fish. And, and if you're talking about it in terms of expectations, the value came out of being about $7. If you extend it to reality, the value came out at 23 mainly because expectations never match reality. Um, so those are those sorts of things. So, so, so we know that you're going to have these big differences as well, that we've got methods, we've got income, we've got people's attitudes and expectations. And in fact, we've then got these feedbacks. So, so Carbone and Smith were, were looking at trying to use these partial equilibrium estimates inside one of those general equilibrium models where, where you go in and get all those feedbacks. And they were looking at trying to assess the value of a program that might improve air and, and water quality. And they were identifying health and recreational <coughs> fishing benefits as some of the potential side effects of this. So we could say we could estimate a value of an improvement, and, and so in common speak, that's the gap between the two demand curves. It's sort of a bit simplistic, but that's sort of the way it's going. But the problem is that if you're actually going to increase the price of petrol, then it's actually going to affect the cost of going out on a fishing trip, particularly if you're, if you're not rough, and most people don't. So we actually find that the program is going to affect the value of the fishing trip, which is going to change the shape of your demand curve, which is going to affect your values. So as soon as you incorporate those extra feedback effects and the general equilibrium price effects, etc., surprise, surprise, you end up with different values. Now, the one that was coming up with these guys, of course, was that in their study of, of the value of the potential improvements, once you got the feedback effects, you almost always came up with the, with the environment winning out. It was an even stronger benefit through those ones. And this was actually matching some of the stuff that was coming up out of Marina's things as well. So back to this Douglas Adam or the, or the Arthur Dent problem, where we come up with all these valuation techniques and we know that the numbers that are generated depend on a lot of different types of things. So really when we're told that the answer is 42, and I hear it on good authority, I think it was Adriana was telling me she, she was reading an evaluation study where someone had said their answer was 42.49, and there was a footnote to it that said a reviewer had said this should be 42. <laughs> so, so yeah, when we come up with the number 42, it's basically meaningless unless you've got it embedded in, in the whole context of the study in which it's been done. You know what people's expectations were, you know, you know what the time of day was, you know what the precise method was, etc. And to just turn around and grab a value off the website and compare it with another value, it's, it's not going to be producing meaningful confirmation or meaning information. There's also this question about whether there is a systematic tendency to undervalue the environment, and I think that's worthy of a bit of investigation, whether that once you get these expectations of feedback effects, whether we're, we're undervaluing the importance of the environment. Um, and, and I think if we're going to be using and continuing to use these approaches, we really need to, to work out how to reconcile them to scale and perhaps get past the micromania of, of focusing on whether it's a truncated binomial or a zero truncated ne negative binomial controlling for endogenous stratification and perhaps think about some bigger picture problems like whether we're clearing the planet Earth to make way for an intergalactic scale and, and the endogeneity may not be such an important issue. Um, and, and part of this, I think, where we're, where we're looking at it is some other alternative assessment techniques. So we might be trying to refine those other ones, but we might be looking at some alternative <coughs> assessment techniques. So some of the ones we've been playing with, um, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that Christine was playing with, and I think most of you were familiar with that, where she was wandering around and asking <coughs> fishers to rate and rank different types of values, ecosystem services. Um, so I won't go into that. Silva Larson um, is uh, an adjunct with us and she's been doing some work on importance. She did a PhD developing a thing called the Index of Dissatisfaction and I'll talk about that a bit because there's some interesting things there. 
But there's also a whole emerging body of literature that, that's looking at the contribution of the environment to the overall quality of life, and, and I think there's some really neat stuff happening there. So, this whole important stuff. Um, some of this will look very much like Christina's work, and, and it was starting and building on that by saying, we'll go around and ask people about the relative importance of things instead of just putting numerical dollars on it. And, and so Silver's uh, work was beginning to go around by... Um, interviewing people across the north saying on a scale of 1 to 100 how important are all these different things to your overall quality of life and the sorts of things that she was asking about was, was using rivers, it was very much a focus on, on the rivers project about that it was saying you know, the, the existence value of rivers or rivers for using for recreational fishing or just for recreation in general and those were the sorts of context the typical things that come up when people are trying to assess a range of different values associated with an environment. Um, interestingly enough, the values that were being associated with the use of rivers for commercial purposes were much lower than the values that were associated with um, bequesting the rivers for future generations or actually using the rivers to support human life or other life um, in terms of other plants and animals. So, so this was actually quite a nice finding, but then, of course, you pass that to policymakers and they go, yeah, OK, big world, how am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with that when I get to do an election campaign? How am I going to use that information? Saying it's important, big world, you know, I can't defend my, my decision to, to stop development or promote development as it goes. So part of what Silver then went on to do was to actually develop what she called the Index of Dissatisfaction. Um, I think it, it might be a heritage thing. I think some people like speaking in double negatives. Um, but in essence, what she was in essence had to do was say, if something is really important to people's overall well-being, but everything's hunky-dory, then let's not bother fussing about it. When you've got limited policy focus and policy concerns, and that was the adage my father used to always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So it's not just a matter of working out whether something's important, it's a matter of trying to work out how broke it is. And, and, and combining those two things. Likewise, if something is broke, you're only going to bother fixing it if it matters. You know? So you break something valuable and important, you try to do what you can to fix it up. If you actually break you know, something you've always really hated, you might have to throw it in the bin and say, cool, that's gone. So that was the importance of combining the two. And in essence, as well as asking people to, to talk about the importance of a value, she was asking how satisfied they were with the value and combining them to the top. So something gets to the top of the charts in her index of dissatisfaction. If people think it's important and they're really upset about it and they're cranky about it, and all of a sudden we went from a situation where we're saying the most important things in life are the human, are the waters for biodiversity, for human life and for bequests, to saying that the most important things in life is water for commercial purposes. Now this rings true to me when I hear the election campaign at the moment. We're hearing that the economy is the most important thing. Everyone's talking about the economy. And I think people are erroneously interpreting it as meaning that people therefore think that money is much more important than anything else in the world. The economy could well be coming to the top of the charts in the Australian agenda just as it came to the top of the charts in the Northern Australian agenda because of people's concern about the way that commercial activity was affecting their rivers. It wasn't that they thought it was important to earn more money. There were, there were some people who were really concerned about using water for money, but a big chunk of people wanted to talk about it because they thought that it might be damaging the things which they felt were important. It was that externalities effect. So I think that's actually got quite a funky way of looking at things when you're trying to, to use alternate non-money ways of assessing the importance of the environment. Other sort of stuff, I promised to throw some, some data up on the reef. This is just preliminary stuff coming out of our NERP study on the GBR catchment. And so some of you will have seen this before many times and been quite bored. But we've been running with our questionnaires up and down the coast. We've been uh, harassing people living um, in the postcodes, 106 different postcodes up and down the Australian coast, saying yeah, how important are each of these things to the <coughs> quality of life. Again, we're coming up with the same type of things, which the things which are most important, so dark green is actually saying that those got ticked very important. As things come up red, they're beginning to say these things are relatively unimportant. So I've tried to sort of rank them in order so the things on the far left are the things which were getting the most important votes. 
And indeed, what we find here is the stuff that's coming up is lack of visible rubbish. I think that might be a, an aesthetic value type thing that's coming up. We've got healthy reef fish, healthy coral reefs. There's all this stuff that comes along. And you've really got the commercial stuff coming in down the end of the scale. Then, and, and those questions were framed up sort of how important do you think the jobs and the incomes are that are associated with these industries. So we're getting a similar message that the, the people who are responding to here are saying the environment may be more important. Now, again, we can take that to policy makers and they say, OK, good, but how am I going to use that to defend it and, and, and perhaps I need some more, some marginal information because policy makers normally are saying, how about a change in something? How is that going to affect? So our questionnaire was also asking people to tell us how different changes to the environment or the economy would affect their overall quality of life. So, so we're going directly to that utility function. And again, down here, the red is indicating these things would make people really unhappy, and it's up to the point where the green is saying it would make people happier. So the things over here are the stuff which is most important to people in terms of if these things went wrong, it would really upset them. And the things that would make them really upset is if there were lots more oil spills, if there was twice as much rubbish, if the ocean got murkier, if there was half as much live coral. We don't get to prices until down here. And that's a 20% increase in price. So this sort of thing is indicating people are saying, whether it's reality, because these aren't stated preferences, there's always questions there, but people are saying that environmental degradation would actually have more of a significant impact on terms of their overall quality of life then would a 20% increase in the cost of living. So that's quite interesting. And that's where I started to invoke Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, this is Natalie's theory of relativity. It's not Albert's. This is Natalie's theory of relativity. And what I said, I thought, was saying, well, look, we know that, that the tourism industry is supposed to be worth more than $5 billion of tourism and, and commercial fishing. So if we know it's worth more than $5 billion, and if we know people think that reefs are even more important than the tourism industry, so that that's probably worth more than five, can we say that both of them together are worth more than ten? Well, sorry, that's our, our Venn diagram problem again. So we're back into the, this issue of separability. And, and in fact, it gets to this idea that we can't just sort of add them up if there's the overlap be between them. And, and formally, from the economic point of view, it comes apart of this difference between, they, they talk about separability in production or separability in consumption. And the example, the reason I, I thought I'd better bring that up is because as biophysical scientists, I think most of the time the, the default is to think about it from the production side of the economy rather than the consumption side. And so sheep is my example, where sheep produce both mutton and wool. They're, they're inseparable in, in that context. If you, if you have one, you've got the other. But in terms of when it comes to the consumption side of things, the meat and the wool are sold in vastly different markets. And, and they've really got nothing to do with it. From the consumer's point of view, they're, they're completely separable. So in that context, it's OK to split them apart and say the value of the sheep is the value of the wool plus the value of the meat. You, you can do that. Now, formally, they, they've got all these fancy economic tests for that one where you actually go away and you calculate this thing called the marginal rate of substitution and you test to see whether the marginal rate of substitution depends on the quantity of another good. The nice, simple analogy that I've heard from that, which is really funky, is it turns around and says, if you want to, to just work out whether your goods are separable, consider the case of a car, a bicycle, and petrol. And, and in this case, we would say people's willingness to trade a bicycle for a car is going to depend upon whether they've got petrol or not. And so that's really what they're trying to do. And, and, and clearly, if you've got petrol, then you might prefer the car. If you've got no petrol, then the bicycle's the, the better option. And, and so those three goods interact together and it doesn't make sense to consider them separately. Now, if we're supposed to do this with our GBR study where we've got 18 different goods and services, that comes off with being 153 different pairs and, and, and says against 16, which means you've got a questionnaire about 4,632 pages long. Um, for some reason, we didn't think our, our response rates were going to be really good with that. And, and so we've been playing with a whole bunch of different ways of, of trying to assess separability. And uh, this was actually coming up with some work that Ara Lee was doing as part of her PhD. And again, some of, some of you guys might have, might have done this, but might not have worked out that she was contributing to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. And, but what she was doing was she was wandering around in the Torres Strait and she was saying, hey, can, can you guys tell me about all the different benefits that are associated with the traditional dugong and, and fishing industry? And, and they were coming up with a big long list like we've got for the GBR with, with all these different things. 
And she put those lists of, of, of data and, and she drew pictures of each one of those things and went back to the people and said, can you organise those pictures on a table for me, please, and put the stuff that goes well together in a similar pump? Yep. She came up with a really pretty picture when she did some multi-dimensional scaling on that, which gave her three very clearly separable piles. And then she was able to look at the importance of each one of those things, the average importance. And because one of those piles happened to be associated with the market very clearly on food values, she could then estimate the value of food Knowing that this was more important meant that she could then say, well, if this is, I think it was about 350,000, then this one must be more than 350,000, so the value of them together must be more than 700. So it was really quite a funky outside the box approach to doing things. So we were trying to do similar exercises with this GBR. We had all these pretty pictures. We went on to workshops. We got people to do all these mapping exercises. We were also running some, some other background correlations on the big data sets to be able to do this. And we think this is our mud map. Didn't come up as nicely as I believe with, with those sorts of things. But in essence, what we've done for these ones here is the height of the item that's listed tells how important it was. So the things which people were telling were most important to their overall quality of life and well-being is up high, the visible rubbish, the healthy coral reefs, etc. As you get further and further down the list, we come to the things which were actually considered to be less and less important to well-being. The other thing we've got in this chart is we've actually put a circle around the things which were just inseparable. Didn't matter which way we looked at it, whether it was cognitive mapping, whether it was looking at the correlation between scores of importance of satisfaction, or whether it was looking at cross correlations of importance, etc. They grouped together. There, there was no way you could pull them apart. But the other thing is that we could find some evidence that that visible rubbish was actually making just a direct contribution to overall quality of life. That was that was inseparable in the formal economic tests of the way people would respond to pollution and rubbish along those sorts of things. But it was also making a contribution to the recreational values and thus contributing indirectly as well through those ones. So it wasn't clearly separable from these things, but there was a separable impact on quality of life. <coughs> Likewise, for the whole healthy coral reefs, etc., they were making a direct contribution to the quality of life. That was that the existence values, the, the non-use values contribution to quality of life, but they were also supporting recreation and incomes, earnings, jobs, and thus contributing indirectly. So, we can't then turn around and say, well, Access Economics has told us this bit's worth 5.3 billion, and so these bits must, must be worth more than 5.3, <coughs> so we're looking at 12 billion, because it's just too messy. We're, we're playing with the Venn diagram there. But we think we've got a few more mathematical gymnastics to go through, but we think that this is just so separable in all different contexts that we can actually play the relativity on this one by saying, well, we know what the value of jobs and income for mining and agriculture are, and that's clearly separable from all of these things. These things are all more important, so if this value is worth whatever billion dollars, then the whole collective reef and all the things that it provides to people is worth more than the jobs and income from the mining industry. So that's where we're going. We sort of quite like that. Um, again, that's back to a total value when, when people are talking about things and it's not always playing into marginal values. So I'm just going to really quickly go on to these marginal value stuff. Um, as I said, the economists don't think you can measure happiness. The psychologists think you can. And so there's a whole body of literature that's built up over the years from, from Easterlin when he's wandering around and surveying people on your overall satisfaction. You can get up on the OECD website and they have which countries are the happiest and, and how people are going and, and they've got these scales on how to measure happiness and, and how, to, how to do all these different bits and pieces. The emerging body of literature that's coming up in economics, which is trying to get these marginal values, is actually getting away from dollar values altogether and saying, well, let's pretend we can measure utility directly and, and a cardinal. We'll ask someone how happy that is, and that's all we'll ask them. We'll just tell them, tell us how happy you are. And we might collect a bit of information about income, age, and gender because people know that those things matter. Um, for those of you who are under 45, happiness drops until you're about 45, and then from then on it gets better. So you, you've got misery to look forward to when I'm on the home stretch. Um, but those are the sorts of things that, that keep going through there. 
And then you can actually collect your objective indicators of the environment and, and see if you can tell statistically the relationship between environmental quality and life satisfaction. And, and technically, you can, you, know, you can use coefficients to, to estimate your, your traditional economic values by recognising that you can do some uh, mathematical manipulation of coefficients <coughs> that come out of this equation to, to come up and do the comparison across all those sorts of things. And, and it's all linked back to, to you might have to do some adjustments and, and some changes to your estimations when you come if not everyone has that same trade-off between income and utility, if people value it differently. And, and most economic stuff assumes that everyone's marginal value of, of income is the same. And this technique at least allows you to adjust for the fact that not everyone thinks money is equally important and you can do that. Um, moreover, it actually doesn't, it, it gets around that problem of people having to try to build their expectations into the answers about the environment. It, it gets uh, around a lot of these other problems on strategic responses and imperfect information, um, and it doesn't presuppose equilibrium. So we've got quite a few PhDs working on various studies on these ones, so that'll be really interesting to see what sort of progress we make on those realms in terms of where they're going. Um, and I think, I was going to... I was going to flick through uh, some other macroeconomic type approaches, but I think I might leave that alone because uh, I'll leave time to ask questions. And I'll flick to my very last slide, which is uh, the fact that you've got that valuation. It, it, it might help, um, but I think we really need to, to look at where we have to change things. And uh, that there's some really neat, funky approaches, particularly some of these macroeconomic ones that don't propose equal, uh, presume equilibrium. But we might have to invoke um, chaos theory and Edward Lorenz to help us on that one because we're, we're way off in other realms as we go. So, thanks. Thank you. comments on Natalie's attempt to argue that economists are more useful than accountants? <laughs> All right. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll take the given and we'll get a question. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if any of this valuation that is being done in all the different ways that it's being done ever considers health and society as well, the whole in terms of you know, medical expenses for mental health escalation in mental health problems and suicide rates and all those sorts of things. There's, there's a huge body of literature that looks at that, and there's a whole field of health economics, and, and some of them use techniques akin to this. Mm -hmm. I think the health economists got a bit wary of prices before the environmental economists. They're, they're, um, they're a couple of decades ahead, a bit like uh, Australians always lagging behind all the rest of the world on policy. And they've gone to a lot of things where they're assessing quality of life adjusted years and, and trying to pull that surprise. Um, but there's a whole body. And I, I think I'm not aware, though, of, of these ways of trying to blend it and take it from that holistic, so the health and the other one. And I think that's where that life satisfaction stuff might be really useful because conceptually you can say, well, put in the environment and we'll also try to put in factors like health and, and you might need some nested models in there to, to see the extent to which the environment contributes to health and then contributes to well-being. And, and you know, I, I can see that the analysis would get quite messy, but I think conceptually it, it, it might be a really neat way to go. Is there uh, any assessment on the impact of the reversibility of certain things? So say you were comparing development versus use where use might continue for a certain period of time without having any significant impact, whereas development, once it's done, it's irreversible. Yeah, and, and, there's, and I'm not as up to speed on it as I should be, but a lot of that then gets into this idea of, of projecting the streams of benefits or costs into the future, and then um, the, the old way of discounting, which would then turn around and, and benefits in the future are worth less than the benefits now. But there's recognition that that, that just it biases everything in favour of development, much like some of these techniques, I think, are very biased towards development. So they start applying with things called overlapping generations models and not discounting, and there's some reverse discounting, I think. So, so it's, it's in that whole areas of literature of discounting that's trying to deal with that intergenerational equity, um, which is sort of linked back to that irreversibility of, of your options or one or something into the future or, or something given up altogether. 
Love me a graph. The graph where people do respond the same to the Great Barrier Reef. They like the environmental values and they prefer them over the commercial values. And you mentioned in the context of upcoming elections and the like. Now I've noticed this election, the last election, conspicuous absence of environment. So my question is, where do you find these respondents for the questions? Because <laughs> it is not an issue. I was rang up by pollsters the other day. It was not an issue. I made an issue, but it was not an issue. It hadn't been for the last two elections. Well, the, the respondents were actually an interesting one. Was for a start, we sent out um, questionnaires to households up and down the coast. And of course, because you can't hold the gun to people's head and say you must fill it in, as soon as you go that way, you know you're going to get your survey response bias. Yep. So we've made sure that we've collected the demographic data of respondents, and, and we because it's a sort of hot off the press type thing, we haven't pulled that out for, for those ones yet. But if it matches all previous responses, the sorts of people that you get overrepresented in surveys are the old, well-educated females. Um, so so, so I, I think we've automatically got a bias towards that, that towards the old babes like me who are filling in the questionnaire. But the other one we do, we knew that was going to be a problem, and we were running a, uh, a parallel survey of tourists through the COP through the year, where we were bailing up tourists at all sorts of different places, at airports, at lagoons, at caravan parks or whatever. And whenever people were out collecting data for the tourists, they also had some residential surveys there. So we made a concerted effort to tag the mining industry with all the fly-in, fly-out. And we've got, uh, we had more than 130 of our respondents were <coughs> working for the mining industry, so, so we were quite neat there. And when we get, I kept thinking, well, that's going to change the ranking. The mining should be coming up as more important. Why isn't it coming up? And, and I, I was quite confused with this. I was talking to Ricardo, who's been doing a lot of stuff on the fly with <coughs> fly out miners. And, and his take on it was that the guys he was interviewing were saying they could work anywhere. They could, they could fly to anywhere in the world. But what was really important to them was the choice of where they and their family lived and where they went. And that's where the environmental <coughs> values were coming up. And, and in essence, if this place got trashed, they'd then move somewhere else. And they'd still keep working the same place, but they would move to live in a nice place. So, I mean, I want, I want to play with the data more so on that. Um, so I, I, I'm thinking it, it could be that this is represented, but I think it's, that's where I was doing Silver's thing. I think the stuff that goes to the top is the stuff that people are annoyed about and concerned about and worried about. And this obsession with the economy could be not because everyone thinks it's so important, but because people are worried. Um, um, and, and some of it could be about the money, some of it could be the distribution of benefits, some of it could be the side effects, but I, I think it's naive to simply assume that when people are talking about the economy, it means that they're talking about it because they think money is the only important thing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask about uh, stated values, willingness to pay. That's all very well in the lounge room. What happens afterwards when you actually have to put up some money, or you lose yeah. something. Well, that was the one that I thought was really interesting because the, the, <coughs> the classic critique of willingness to pay in particular is the fact that people will tick it and say yes when you're asking, but will they cop it up? And the thing that came out of the GBR one, which is really funny, is there was all these people who saying, oh, the environment's really important, kept coming up, and then we did have some willingness to pay questions in there, and they got some willingness to pay, and said, oh, I'm not paying anything. <laughs> and so, I, I don't think we were, we were getting on that, but we had some follow-up questions on the willingness to pay. And the, the follow-up questions were saying, oh, you know, I'm not prepared to pay anything because I think it's a waste of time because climate change is going to trash it or the national disaster is going to trash it. And, and that wasn't much of, there, there wasn't much evidence for the fact that that was what was pulling people back. But we had some questions about, I don't want to pay unless everyone else has to pay too. And the responses on that were overwhelming. And I think a lot of it is that equity issue where it was more people... Um, rebelled so much against carbon tax. They were saying it's not that we don't want to protect the environment, we just don't want to be the only country in the world that's actually doing something. And and and, and it may, I think it's back to this need for institutional reform for, for real progress, that we need to think about ways of making sure that everyone does pay and, and you might get more contribution. Um, yeah, no one wants to be the only bunny holding the can. Do you think assigning a monetary value to things like that creates some kind of moral disconnect where people can say, oh, well, you know, I can pay for something so it doesn't affect me anymore. I don't have to, I'm not morally obliged to actually take care of it. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. I, I mean, it, it, it might. Um, so I'm, I'm not up, I'm not, I'm not up on the list of that it might do, yeah. Like, for example, where people 
keep getting in trouble for, for leaving their kids too late at daycare. <coughs> so then the daycare starts charging them, and then more people leave their kids there because they can just pay for it. Yeah, so it might, yeah, there, there might be a bit of that on this whole user pays attitude that we're moving, and maybe that's why. Well, and even yeah. just the whole idea of assigning monetary value to the environment and then using that to weigh up against development. It could be that some people will respond. And the, the protest vote stuff is huge. As soon as you do these surveys, you get about 30% of people just won't answer the questions on, on those willingness to pay. And, and we were doing some analysis where we were running some surveys once where we said that some questions where we allowed people to protest and say, I'm just, I just morally offended by questions like this, I'm not answering it. And then other people would fill out the willingness to pay. And, and we had enough big enough sample to start comparing the, the responses. And in fact, even though we had um, we had much fewer responses gave us numbers, if you gave people the option to protest, they protested and they just didn't tip it. But if you forced them and cornered them into doing it, you know, so, so you didn't give them the option, the distribution of responses was the same. So, you know, I, I found that interesting. That um, I guess my problem with the willingness to pay that is when people grab the number and treat it like it's an absolute. To me, I think I think it's useful in terms of an, an indicator, um, but it really worries me when people say, oh, it's, it's 42. Um, I, I think that's a bit dangerous, actually. Yeah. Sure. Uh, do you think with the willingness to pay, do you think perhaps some of your respondents may feel that they already are paying? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of them are paying tax, and a lot of them are paying a lot of tax. Yes. And, uh, and, the, and we got that in the, re in the questionnaires people, as well. With the yes. carbon pricing and whatnot, I think a lot of people are, wait a minute, we, we should already be paying for these services, these environmental solutions, <coughs> uh, uh, ways to live more sustainably through our tax. We have, a group of, we have a bunch of bodies that are doing what they can to, to make the whole system more sustainable. So, yes, absolutely. And, and those again, were... again, for every right or uh, sensible environmental decision, is just it's double dipping. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are saying, wait, I don't want to pay more because I am paying. You know, the, the, the government should be making better decisions rather than being yes. continually having to pull out more money out of. And I think that's the importance of, of potentially exploring some of these non-monetary assessment systems because you're, you're getting into all that sort of, of strategic response and, and the life satisfaction stuff, I think, gets away from that. You're, you're getting away from the well, strategic response. That's my other question, actually. Uh, trying yeah. to uh, unify your Venn diagram, trying to unify um, you know, your, your, your ethics and your aesthetics sides of the arguments and happiness and all these things with monetary <laughs> utility. Uh, I guess the question is raised, is economic rationalism rational anyway? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Well, I mean, that's one of the nice things about some of the life satisfaction, is that you're not presuming equilibrium and, and, and rationalism. You're just using observed life satisfaction, observed environmental mm. condition, observed income, and you're not trying to force it all into a model to say, I'm assuming that people are behaving and acting rationally, I'm assuming they've got perfect information, I'm assuming we're in equilibrium, because those sorts of, they're, they're, they're questionable. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yeah, like, uh, absolutely. I think the economic yeah. uh, models are better at detecting irrationality rather than mm. rationality. Mm. So uh, it's, it, 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 oh, yes. I think that economists and psychologists need to talk a little bit more. Um, sorry, Peter was next, and, and we, we might squeeze one in more. I agree with your last point, <laughs> being a, a psychologist background myself. But my question is, you know, we're talking about valuing of environment, but um, in the in the context of being the manager of NRM um, in this region, the other side which is relevant to us as well is valuing the stewardship of that environment. You know, and, and particularly in terms of um, public goods or goods that you know may be in your private backyard but affects others like water assets which you mentioned, which in, in particular is going to be quite relevant in our region in the increase um, potential for the resource sector you know, industry development. So, has, has there been an attempt to try to value the stewardship of the environment and present it in a way of, you know, you're contributing to the yeah. common good? I'm actually, um, 
there's a study on the Talkden at the moment where we're looking at, um, at, at the whole sort of land management as um, we're using techniques from agricultural economics where they have what they call multi-input, multi-output production functions and they say that you need to get these estimation techniques to allow for the fact that people have cattle and crops on the land instead of just a single crop, single, you know, the, the micro stuff's all single. And we put in the sort of the value of the, the market production, but also the value of the, the protecting biodiversity, the maintaining cultural values, the maintaining social values, and, and trying to get a bit of a handle on, on those ones and picking up people's um, objectives. For it. So instead of assuming that everyone's objective is to make money, to actually trying to pick up the fact that they've got some of those objectives, other ones. Um, there's a few challenges trying to embed them within the economics models and, and you know, I, I'm, I'm, we still have a crack at it because I think it's important and, and I, I sort of, it's a bit like this life satisfaction and separability, none of it's finished yet, but I, I think there's some really interesting avenues to go to. Um, but there's also, the, I mean, Vanessa was looking at trying to get some um, values of stewardship using the, the choice modelling type approaches and, and people's connection to the land. So there, there's a lot out there that's recognising the importance of stewardship and the fact that that will completely alter people's use and, and abuse of the land, depending upon really what their objective functions are. I had a question about our socialisation as a society in terms of, you know, if you watch TV news or you read newspapers or magazines or media, it's full of economics, politics, sort of threats to our well-being in terms of crime and, you know, dying in car accidents and reporting and all that stuff and sport and weather. And you never mentioned the environment. I'm missing something really big going on. Don't you find that in a big... <coughs> missing thing from the general population Absolutely. ability to actually even be aware of the Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and I think it's one of my concerns with the um, the valuation of the environment it mm -hmm. is I and many others like me took up the cause of getting into environmental valuation because we figured that if, if you didn't try to, to make people realise how important it was, they'd trash it. <coughs> and so part of it was trying to say, well, we'll put a dollar sign on it so we highlight the importance to the other people. But then you find that these dollar techniques are actually then biasing the decision makers in favour of the preference of the rich. And, and the other research that I've been looking at says you look at development pros, processes and they actually favour the distribution of development in favour of the rich. So it's sort of like, you know, the rich, you, you tell people they're allowed to vote and we use cost-benefit analysis with a, a, a valuation in there as a voting system. And that then means that the rich people, you know, it, it, it's classic gerrymander, the rich people get more vote, so the development goes ahead, so they get even richer, so, so the next time you have a vote, there's even higher propensity for the trashing to occur. And it's sort of like this, um, this self-sustaining cycle that will take us further and further away from the environment and, and how we stop that and bring that back into something, I don't know, because when I look at all the, the trees gone out of Iceland and we've already dug up all the minerals in a lot of places throughout the world, I